put you all over my toe. Great, we are live now. Uh, good uh, morning from uh, Francini and good evening from Texas. So, um, welcome to the Facebook Live Talk. Um, today, we are very honored to invite Luke Edmondson and uh, Dave Edmondson to join us uh, with their uh, latest talk with uh, R1200 Ring Flash. So, Luke, just a quick update. In case you guys haven't met Luke yet, he's the grandmaster of WPPI. He's in the speaker co uh, selection committee of PPA, and he's also AIPP International Photographer of the Year, which is for Australia. And uh, he's also the fellow of SWPP from UK. So he's um, he's a world-renowned master in terms of photography, pretty much everywhere. And uh, I, if I work my ass off for <laughs> my battle for another 20 years, I probably just wouldn't be where he is, hopefully. Um, so he is a great friend and he's a great mentor. I learned lots of things from this guy. I actually got my aha moments from, um, from his um, online tutorial, right? Connecting the dots. Um, if you guys are interested, you can check his, um, check his online tutorial out in his, um, in his store and we will drop a link uh, after the talk. Uh, just in case you're interested. So today we're going to talk about R1200. I look at the lecture notes. I was really, oh, this is really good stuff because quite often um, we use the same lights, but we ignore about um, the modifier is a huge part, right? A huge part in terms of lighting. Um, we, in the online program, lots of time you see the comparison says, you know, what's the difference between a light, a softbox, an umbrella, but in real life, most likely we are going to use multiple light setup, especially for studio shoots, right? Mm -hmm. How does uh, multiple lights combination with different modifier works? Which modifier is good for you um, in terms of white mm -hmm. umbrella, silver umbrella, shoot through umbrella, or you know, beauty dish or bare bulb? And uh, what's the correct formula? There's no silver bullets per se, <laughs> but what <laughs> what's uh, what's the correct formula for you? I will hand this over to Luke um, to take us to a very exciting in-depth explanation and adventure. Meanwhile, all the questions are welcome. Well, thank you, Aries, very much. And uh, greetings to you guys from Texas. Uh, I'm here with, uh, I'm actually the second best photographer in my family. I'm here with my father, uh, David Edmondson, who is an accomplished photographer in his own right. And so, as Ari said, we'll be talking today about uh, the Godox R1200, which is their latest uh, ring flash. It works with the uh, AD1200 Pro, which many of you may be uh, familiar with. It's a single head 1200 uh, watt uh, power pack uh, that recently came out. And both of us have had a chance uh, to be able to play around with this and, uh, and get some experience. Uh, we were also fortunate enough to try and uh, go through the process of making a tutorial video uh, with it. And we said, you know, it would really be nice would be able to put some uh, additional words behind uh, some of our thoughts here and perhaps include some of the content that we didn't uh, put into that video in this particular talk. So what is the uh, the R1200 uh, ring flash? Well, it looks like this. Uh, it's about uh, eight inches in size. It's a rather large ring flash uh, as, uh, from that standpoint. And uh, certainly it um, uh, with the 1200 watts, it's powerful enough to be used outdoors, indoors, sunlight, uh, you know, whatever situation you want, you can have enough power to be able to pull off the type of shot you're wanting. And just in case there's anybody out there who is uh, starting out in photography and maybe isn't as familiar with what we're talking about when we say 1200 watts, just a visual representation uh, for it is roughly ballpark. Uh, it's equivalent to what would you say, 15 or so exactly. uh, of your speed lights, uh, if you were to put all of them together. So that gives you an idea of how much power uh, is behind uh, this particular ring flash uh, if you were trying to use it in different situations. Uh, also talked just a second ago about the fact that it's about eight inches. And so from that standpoint, what's the difference between it and the standard head for the AD1200 Pro? And the difference really comes down to what's called the guide number which is uh, a little bit lower than uh, it would be with the standard five head or five inch uh, head. And the reason for that 
is because it is a, a larger light source. And I think that's one of the things that we've really fallen in love with in terms of using it is because it is larger and because of the way that the flash tube is put around it, it really produces a beautiful, soft mm -hmm. uh, quality of light. Sometimes we even put it into the soft box or put it into a, a, a umbrella with actually the diffusion on top of it. it makes a very soft light. Yep. So when people think about ring flash, you know, uh, I would think that arguably they kind of default into what I'd call almost like beauty slash makeup. Uh, it's the very tight shot. You know, a lot of times when people get a ring flash, uh, one of the things they're hoping for or uh, they're looking for, or they want to be able to get is those circular catch lights uh, in the eye. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to go through a series of shots that we did where we tried to keep things as consistent as possible. So we could really look at, well, what is the different effect uh, that we're getting from a different approach and try and look at it as kind of as neutral a sense as, as possible in terms of the model's expression, pose, gesture, all those kinds of things. So we're not jumping from here's one scene, here's another scene, can you see the difference? And so in this first shot, it's very much like what you would expect in terms of just a tight uh, beauty type shot. You can see on the left-hand side, uh, th th there's no modifier to it. In other words, it's just the built-in um, uh, protective glass and uh, what would you call it even, reflector? Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the built-in reflector uh, that comes with the head when you purchase it. And so you can see over there, as you look on the left-hand side of my screen, uh, the circular catch lights in her eyes are noticeably smaller than what they are on the right-hand side. The right-hand side, there they're bigger because we're using the beauty dish. And when we use that beauty dish, it creates what? An even larger light source uh, for us to be able to use. You may also notice that if you looked at the amount of contrast, these are straight out of the camera, uh, not retouched um, uh, JPEGs. So on the left-hand side, you have a little bit more contrast, perhaps even a little bit more saturation coming in uh, from using it uh, with just the built-in reflector. No shadow too. No shadow is different, exactly a little bit more defined. The beauty dish, it's really starting to soften it up when it's in that tight and that close. Anything else that you'd want to talk about in terms of? No, no. I think we're good. Because really, for us, you know, uh, the biggest or the funnest thing to be able to use a beauty dish for would be moving beyond uh, this type of beauty shot, the thing that many of us would expect uh, to be able to shoot. So this was shot at F11, uh, 250th of a second, ISO 64, flash at a quarter power. And again, it's a 1600 watt uh, power pack. And also, we were supposed to kind of show what the different modifiers look like. Mm -hmm. So we were actually almost just doing a very even lighting in order to uh, just show the effect of the modifier. Probably not how we would light if we were going to light it ourselves. If you're trying to light for mood or drama. Correct. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but if the application called for it, we, we would 100% light like this if this is what the, a client needed. Okay. So if I was starting out with a ring flash, and this is where I really had to slow myself down in terms of working with it. I basically said, well, what are all the mistakes that somebody might make if they had a ring flash? <laughs> so, so that you could figure out how it is that you could fix it. Even we made those mistakes. Well, yeah, I was sitting there like going, okay, now how do I put this on? What do I need to do? And so forth. So on the left-hand side, you can see what, if we were backed off and we were using just the ring flash to shoot her. Uh, so therefore the flash has gone from a quarter power. It's gone up to a half power at this point in time. But on the right-hand side, we have a light leak that's coming in. So we see a bit of that white light that's coming. And then on uh, the bottom, we have what I'm going to call more of a vignette. And so my question for you would be, well, what would cause the light leak and what would cause the vignette? Now, the thing for you to look at is it really comes down to where the ring flash is positioned in relation to your lens. So in this particular case, this is the standard reflector that's on in this example. Uh, on the left hand side and you can see where the lens is there and uh, so do you think that this causes you to be able to get more of the vignette or do you think this causes you to get more of the light leak? depending on where you adjust it <laughs> well if you if you have if you had the light uh, if you don't push the ring flash far enough back on the barrel of your lens then all of a sudden you may either get that vignette or that light leak coming in arguably this one is the one in my opinion that's going to create uh, more of the uh, vignetting effect because this one uh, is going to create more of the uh, potential light leak depending on how uh, that light is coming off of the beauty dish 
and so forth. So if you're ever in a situation where you start to shoot and you haven't, the first thing you want to do is you want to center your lens up uh, within the frame. It has a three point adjustable uh, bracket uh, that you can use. It also doubles as an umbrella mount, uh, which is particularly handy. Uh, but then you also want to make sure that you pull uh, the, uh, the flash back far enough behind your lens, still leaving room for your finger to be able to hit the trigger uh, so that you can avoid having light leaks or having vignettes. Another thing that can happen, which we all know from shooting just like any camera directly into something that's reflective, is you may want to watch out for what? Red eye. Now, in this particular case, this was not when we were in tight uh, with the model. This was when we were further back. And uh, can I interrupt for a really sure. quick question? Yeah. Uh, so Michael is asking, when you said uh, beauty dish, do you mean the ring flashing to the RF3? 21 reflector, would that be white or silver? Yep, so in this particular case, this beauty dish that we're talking about, uh, this one that I'm showing you in this example is the silver one. The exact model number, I'm not 100% positive on, but it'd be the one that you see in this example picture on the left. Okay. Does that answer the question? So it'd be this, this happens to be the silver reflector that we're using in all these examples. Cool, thanks. Yep. Okay, so we want to avoid red eye. Now, what causes that red eye? Well, a lot of times uh, it's because that light's going in, it's hitting the back of the, the eye, it's reflecting back out, and so therefore uh, we get these red pupils. Uh, in this particular case, I've really zoomed in on, I'm going to just back off here for a second, on this shot here, taken from a distance, I've really zoomed in on it to be able to show that there was red eye being produced. So what are some of the ways that we could avoid the red eye? Well, number one, we could start by turning on our modeling lamp. Now the modeling lamp is bright. Now, if your modeling lamp is, if you're coming in really tight to be able to shoot your, your subject, you may find that it's too much for their eyes. But at a distance like this, that modeling lamp being on will help their pupils dilate and close down and help minimize that red eye. But there's a second way that you could go about doing it. Well, you could move the, move it off camera. <laughs> well, you could, you could afford, okay. Well, I'll, let's go with that. So that's his second way. My, my second way that I was gonna do it is I was gonna say, you can change the ambient light within the room. If you raise the amount of ambient light within the room, you would also accomplish uh, that same effect. Uh, so either approach works, turn on the modeling uh, light. If you're still getting red eye, raise the ambient within the room uh, and that'll help those pupils dilate. And because of the fact that we're shooting that flash straight on into their eyes, it's just something for you to be aware of. And should you be running into it, I wanna help teach you how you, you get around it. So let's look at some uh, lighting examples here, uh, if we can. And so we're gonna produce this image right here through this series of steps that we're gonna walk through. And uh, in this particular case, we, we ended up using three different R1200s to be able to make this shot happen. So how did we go about doing it? Well, you have a base exposure, which was, you know, again, it's that F11 at a 250th of a second at ISO 64. As you can tell, it may or may not be coming through. Perhaps you're seeing just pretty a- Pretty much black. <laughs> it's a, pretty much black. There's just a little hint of the scene appearing in the background there. Hopefully you can kind of see that there's a little hint of it there, but that's the amount of ambient light we had in the room after we had gone about the process of um, turning off all of the flashes. So the first flash that I'm gonna show you that we turn on here is going to be our backlight. And so this is the one that we were using off of our background and we're just simply bouncing it uh, off the ceiling up there to try and have that light come and fall off uh, behind her. And that light's there to create dimension and depth so that it doesn't become just a two dimensional, very flat type picture of her in a picture frame. So in this particular case, that light set to a 16th power. Now, the next one that we're gonna show is this one. This is our ring flash that we're using as our fill. So instead of using the ring flash as our main light, we're using it as our fill light. So therefore, all we need to do here is have it at about an eighth of a power uh, because it's just coming in to be able to open up uh, some of the shadow areas, uh, bring out perhaps a bit more detail, soften some of the, uh, the shadows that are gonna come from the particular main light. And why this is helpful is, you know, we often might think to ourselves, well, I'll just bounce a light. Like there's a white ceiling or a white wall, I'll just bounce. Well, that's always great when you're in situations with white ceilings or uh, white walls or something neutral that you can bounce off of. 
But what happens when you're outdoors on location or if you're in a giant space where it's not possible to bounce anymore? Now, how are you going to do your fill light? So this becomes an excellent way to be able to get that fill light, but still have that soft quality to it as it comes in. So the next light that we're going to go ahead and turn on in this process is going to be our, uh, our main flash. And in this particular case, it's in a white umbrella. It's set to a quarter power, set at roughly 45 degrees, just out of frame. Uh, this does not have any particular uh, diffusion on it. And so if we looked at what does that all look like together, notice how dark the shadows are on the left-hand side over there. Almost uh, looks like dress. an extension of the dress. It looks like an extension of the dress. It looks very directional in the way uh, that it's being lit. And so now, you wind up bringing all three of those together and you can see how it's been softened uh, considerably in the way that it's done. I might even toggle back just a second and just even show you, if you look at the amount of detail that's in the black of her dress, uh, you'll notice that we're starting to get much more detail. Again, these are all straight out of camera, unretouched images. And so you look there and hopefully you're able to see that there's perhaps a bit more uh, detail coming in. And then finally, from there, you go into the post-production uh, process, and that's where you can interpret it as you see fit. What were you thinking in terms of this interpretation? What were you going for? Well, I wanted your eye to go basically to the window and, uh -huh. and feeling like it, she had an outside and that basically there was just maybe one source of light coming in and just hitting her right in the center. And I wanted your eye not to go to the chair that she was standing on. I wanted your eye to go back up into her face and to her hands mm -hmm. uh, and to the heart that she's holding. And so to accomplish that, if you were trying to accomplish that, when you say you want somebody's eye to go there, what technique did you decide to go with in order to, to accomplish that? Are you lightening those areas uh, that you don't want people to look at or are you darkening those uh, areas? I was doing more of a Rembrandt kind of darkening, let your eye just disappear and go away type, yep. type look on that. Yep. And is there anything into... Uh, you know, in this particular case, as I look at this, uh, I do get at least the, the hint of the shape of the chair and so forth. How important is it for somebody to have a foundation, not just to be floating without some sort of visual anchor? Well, I think you have to give them enough dots to put together to know what it is. <laughs> sure. So, but, but at the point that you give them just enough dots to see what it is, I think you can go on and let their eye go to what you want to show them. That's exactly right. So, Let's look at some of these different modifiers. This is what we chose for this particular uh, approach. But hey. what, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Uh, there's a tough question uh, from Chris about the ring flash. He's like, uh, ring flashes are the worst I've ever seen. <laughs> Horrible. Ring lights are not for me, but uh, mm -hmm. all 1200 head diffuse or bounce is a great weapon. Just never use it as a ring, in my opinion. Um, what do you think? Because I looked at the image, it's quite amazing. Uh, maybe ring sure. flash as a sole light source or ring flash combines with others. Like what's the correct way or, you know, what's uh, the, the way of using ring flash will be? So what's the correct, correct way? Opinion? So I, I'd say it like this. Everybody's opinion has value, but yeah. not all opinions are equally valuable in that not all opinions are equally informed. And here's what I mean by that. So uh, Chris may not take my recommendation on what movie he should go see uh, because I don't know Chris well uh, to know what his personal tastes and preferences are. Uh, but he certainly would lean probably more heavily upon uh, or he or she may lean more heavily on uh, what their best friend uh, suggested to him or a sibling might suggest to him because they know them well. And in this particular case, I totally can understand why uh, their personal preference may not be for the, what I'm going to call like the traditional approach uh, with a ring flash. Uh, no piece of equipment is going to solve your problems. They solve a particular problem. Uh, if I'm going into a situation where I need flexibility, uh, then uh, for, for myself, and we're going to show this at the end when we do a commercial shoot here where we, we use the R1200 on the shoot, uh, it was very beneficial for us to be able to have a flash that not only could we put on our camera, but we could also take it off our camera and we could take it off and we could modify it in different ways and have that type of versatility. That's what I appreciate about Godox. Godox thought about it and said, yes, if you're a fashion photographer who loves the style of on camera and no shadows, 
we've got it for you, but we've put a mount on this thing so you can take it off and make it a soft directional light. Yeah. If, if Chris happened to be someone who loved to do a lot of macro work or loved to be able to shoot, I don't know, insects or, or different objects, you know, did product photography or something like that, uh, they may feel much differently about how much they enjoy using a ring flash in a traditional type manner, just directly on their camera, because all of a sudden they go, it gives me the exact look that I need to get as easily as possible. Um, so, you know, that would be uh, my kind of thoughts on, on how to answer that. I completely understand why somebody may not have it as their preference, uh, but I certainly would say it, uh, it's worth considering how you might deploy it. And when the need arises, have it to be able to deploy because again, we're all gonna get in situations where we can't bounce flash. So now how are you gonna add your fill, right? Um, the ring flash produces a more soft quality of light than if you had, let's say a V1 or some other flash or it produces more quantity of light than perhaps a speed flash might if you just had it directly on your camera. Thank you, Luke. What's a great discussion, right? Because um, essentially all the lighting equipment, they are all options. Uh, we as a photographer all have our unique style and um, yeah. just just everybody knows there's an option there. That's all. Yeah. So here's kind of looking at the same shot done a number of different ways and we can kind of evaluate kind of what we're seeing happening from the different modifiers. So on the left hand side, we have uh, the ring flash has been put into the beauty dish and I would argue with you, it's a beautiful, soft quality of light. In this particular case, the exposures never change. They're all the exact same every single time. Uh, because of how we position the lights and we maintain the power and so it, forth. It's part of the right. instructional yeah. thing that we were trying to show. We weren't, we were trying to show what each light would do differently exactly. and, and how minor or how major it might be. Yep. Uh, so if you, you know, if you look at it and you look at, okay, well, here's the beauty dish on the left-hand side. Now we have the white umbrella on the right-hand side. We're starting to get some vignetting because of, of how the, uh, the umbrella wasn't pushed as far back. And so uh, we don't have as much spill happening on that right hand side, but that can be an effect that you might uh, want uh, in your particular picture. Uh, we can also notice if we look down in the shadow areas, uh, kind of how the uh, the umbrella is starting to feather on the edge much more. The, the beauty dish has a be beginning of a feather, but it's a much more crisp line that's being created because obviously the modifier is a smaller modifier being used. We can also notice that it's uh, a little bit more contrasty than it is with the white umbrella. The white umbrella is a little less contrasty, particularly in our highlight areas uh, when we look at those, uh, perhaps even on the gold uh, and things like that of the frame. Now, in our next shot, what we're gonna look at is the difference between, well, okay, if you have the white umbrella and the same white umbrella, just we added the diffusion. And you'll notice that when we add that diffusion, on that right hand side, those vignetting areas are really starting to soften now because we've scattered the light even more. The diffusion is helping uh, open that up uh, in terms of, of what's happening with that natural vignette that was occurring. And even the shadows themselves, uh, the way our speculars are, all those kinds of different things are all slightly modified, not extensively by adding that diffusion to it. Now, if we go from the white umbrella, what would be the next question? Well, what about a silver umbrella? And again, this comes down to personal preference. Uh, the silver has a little bit more, uh, what would you call it? Uh, a little bit more pop, perhaps a little bit more snap uh, in the way that it's creating contrast. Uh, if you look at our speculars, which are the highlights, uh, you can see that they're a little bit- um, On the gold mirror. Yeah, yeah, on the gold mirror, especially on that right-hand side. Uh, they stand out to you a bit more than they do on the left-hand side uh, mm. with the white umbrella. Uh, so perhaps that helps you visualize kind of, you know, the difference between whether you use a white or a silver and both looks, you know, we, we carry both silver and white umbrellas inside of our, uh, uh, our, our bags when we're traveling. And if I'm trying to shoot a, um, uh, an older man or an older woman, who uh, perhaps is getting more wrinkled, you're probably not going with that silver you're umbrella. Going white. You're going white <laughs> all day. Because unless it's a character study, you know, if it was an editorial character study where you want to really focus on those, uh, you're trying to soften. You're trying to soften, soften, soften. Uh, you know, uh, whether that person's a CEO or a secretary or whoever, like uh, you want to make them, you know, look their best uh, to be able to accomplish the needs of whatever your clients, you know, objective mission is. So our background, just to kind of give perspective is, 
Uh, you started as a commercial photographer in 1974 Four. before I was born. And uh, so you're at 46 years, something like that mm -hmm. ballpark of, uh, of uh, commercial photography. And then in, uh, in 2000, mm -hmm. uh, we started shooting weddings cause we were trying to work together and they don't hire two commercial photographers. I could be the assistant, but not two photographers. So weddings seemed like a, a way to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, we've shot, let's say a thousand weddings since, uh, 2000. And, uh, we also are known for some fine art photography that we do. And then of course we do portraits for people that we meet through this process. And the commercial photography was magazines, books, CD covers, and annual reports. And, uh, annual reports are probably the closest thing I think there is to wedding photography in the sense of you have to be many types of a photographer all in one day, but done in a more commercial stylized manner. A lot of times you're using colored gels or dramatic lighting uh, to convey a mood or a look uh, that goes beyond a little bit more, would you say, in that editorial type Absolutely. style? Yeah. So we want to carry, in our case, both white and silver umbrellas and match it specifically to our particular need or client's need for what we're, we're trying to shoot. So what if I had the silver umbrella and then I added the diffusion? Well, on the left side, we have the silver umbrella with no diffusion on the right hand side. We have it with diffusion. As you can see, that natural vignetting that's happening over there on the right-hand side is really starting to soften and almost go away. We're starting to get some feathering there in the shadow area coming off of her dress. It's not as dramatic as what you had from the white umbrella, but it's, it's substantial in the way that it's significantly uh, softer than what the uh, umbrella by itself would be. I would also say to you that uh, we tried to keep these things all as close to possible in the exact same position every single time. So it matched up as much as possible for you. So let's look at all three. So we have the beauty dish on the left. We have the white in the middle and we have the silver on the right. Uh, regardless of whether the vignette would be something that bothered you or not, in terms of the speculars that are hitting onto the gold, which one's the right one? And that is a bit what I would say subjective uh, in terms of what Chris's preference might be or what David's preference might be or what Luke's preference might be. For us, we preferred the one that was a little bit less contrast, which is the white, because it gives us the most flexibility when we go into work on it in post. We can always add a bit more contrast back into the image. Technically, you could also reduce it. But for us, a lot of times it's easier to start with something that's not so contrasty that we're having to really pull contrast out of the shot. We want to generally speaking, want to, when I say salt to taste, we want to salt to taste and add our contrast in typically on the back end. It gives us more flexibility. And, and reducing contrast takes your eye away from areas that you do not want to want them to focus on. That's right. So even in the same scene, you may have different contrast levels depending on where you want to direct the eye. That's exactly right. So now, that is if we were just shooting those things like that, there's no fill light being brought into this. Now, what if we wanted to bring in fill light? And arguably you might say, do you even need to have fill light? Well, in this particular case, we're gonna have the white umbrella on the left and we're gonna have the white with a bounce fill. So in this particular case, we have a light placed over to the left-hand side of our camera and we are simply bouncing it off the wall uh, and ceiling area and then back into the shot. We're trying not to overpower in such a way that it's gonna create its own shadows back into the scene. We're trying to just have it be there enough to start filling in those particular shadows. And on this next example, it will be, well, what if we had that white umbrella, but now we did it with the ring fill? And so which one is gonna be better, that bounce fill or that ring fill? Well, let's take a look. So we have here all three in a row. We have the white, without the, the fill light, then we have a bounce fill in the middle, and then on the right side, we have the ring fill. Now, if I look at this with my eyes, what I see is that that bounce fill has even uh, less shadow going on over there mm -hmm. by the edge of the chair mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how it is. And uh, the ring fill, because of how it was powered, still leaves a little bit more of that shadow, but it's significantly reduced from if there was no fill light at all. And again, we dialed our ring fill to an eighth power. Could you? put it up even higher? Absolutely you could if you wanted to try and reduce that even more or create more frontal lighting. Uh, for us, that eighth of a power from that distance, which would roughly have been, what would you say, 12 feet away, mm -hmm. ballpark, uh, was the right amount of light uh, to be able to uh, 
pop into that shot. Yeah, and the next shot coming up is kind of what was envisioned in our mind too, of what we were trying to accomplish. Yep, yep, yep. So once we did this and we did our example and so forth, then of course we said, okay, uh, now let's do something for ourselves. And so in that particular case, what we created was a shot that looks like this. So just something that kind of plays off of that particular idea, puts her in a little bit different dress, brings in the dog, has a bit of story to it, um, uh, and just hopefully creates a, a portrait that uh, shows a little bit of uh, uh, what I'd call the, the the statues, the columns, the architecture in the background. A little uh, bit of pompous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit of pompous. So what I've got for you next is a video that kind of walks you through uh, some of these things that we just talked about again, and will help reinforce some of these con uh, uh, these ideas, hopefully for you, and perhaps may even lead to some additional questions. So let's watch. Yeah. Hey, I'm Luke Edmondson. And over the next few minutes, I'd like to share how to use Godox's latest ring light, the R1200. This video is meant for someone who's never used a ring light, but also includes our thoughts for more experienced professionals. There are three main areas that we're going to look at. What is the R1200? How can you use it? And why should you have it in your bag? So let's get started. Godox makes great and affordable products for photographers and recently came out with the AD1200 Pro single head battery pack. Hey, look, is that possible? It's about 15 times more powerful than your average speed line. Yes, sir. Yeah, sorry, is that possible to reshare that through YouTube for me to reshare? Because the audio seems to be a bit off. Off. Sure. How about I pull it, uh, pull it up on YouTube for you real quick? Yeah. I'll, um, you know what, I'll just... I'll send it to you in like five seconds here. Thanks for letting us know. No worries. Because, um... Okay, got it. So when you share the Chrome tab, there is uh, something. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. I can do okay. that or I can send it to you. No, if I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do it from my end. Sounds good. That works. Let me just quickly share screen. Chrome tab. Edmondson. Let me know how the audio goes. Yeah. Okay. Hey, I'm Luke Edmondson. And over the next few minutes, I'd like to share how to use Godox's latest ring light, the R1200. This video is meant for someone who's never used a ring light, but also includes our thoughts for more experienced professionals. There are three main areas that we're gonna look at. What is the R1200? How can you use it? And why should you have it in your bag? So let's get started. Godox makes great and affordable products for photographers and recently came out with the AD1200 Pro single head battery pack. For those who aren't familiar, 1200 watt seconds is about 15 times more powerful than your average speed light. Depending on your style and what you're shooting, that extra power can come in handy. The standard head comes with a Bowens mount so that you can use your existing modifiers like soft boxes and more. The ring flash comes with an adjustable bracket allowing you to use it on and off your camera. You can also add the umbrella mount, honeycomb grids, or a beauty dish. Now you might be wondering, does it still support high-speed sync and TTL? Yes, absolutely. Most of the specs and functionality are exactly the same built into the battery pack. That includes being able to use the 40 watt LED light when you're shooting. The X-Series triggers make it compatible with many brands of cameras like Canon, Nikon, Sony, Fuji, Olympus, and Panasonic. The main difference between the two heads is the guide number, which is naturally lower because of its larger size and shape. These attributes also contribute to the softer quality of light that it produces. If you already own the AD1200 Pro, Adding this light is a no-brainer. At worst, it's an extra head. Uses your main light gives you that specialty look. Overall, it's an excellent solution for controlling fill light, whether you're outdoors, in the studio, or on location. So how can we use a ring light? 
Well, there are two main ways. One is with your camera mounted through that center hole or on axis. Using it this way gives us those circular catch lights in the eyes and reduces shadows. Adding the beauty dish reflector softens your lighting even more. The other approach is off camera. You can use the grids, maybe as a hair separation light, the beauty dish, or attach the included umbrella holder to the bracket. Godox offers reflectors and parabolic umbrellas available in either silver or white. Shiny parts, or the speculars of our picture, show brighter highlights when we use silver. White appears softer because it produces less contrast. Adding diffusion can make those shadows even softer. You can also control your contrast by how far you insert the umbrella shaft in relationship to your light source. When working with multiple lights, try using it as a fill flash to minimize strong shadows. Mounting a ring light to your camera helps in situations where you can't or don't want to bounce off a ceiling or a wall. Just dial the power to suit your taste. Our personal preference was to use two R1200s. One is our main light in an umbrella, off camera. The other one we used on our camera as a ring flash. We used that one as the fill light to bring more detail and lighten up the shadows. We even added a third one back behind our set, pointing it at our backdrop, using it to brighten it up and create more dimension and depth. Here are five things that we thought will help the first time you pick up an R1200 ring flash. Push the side button both down and in when attaching or removing the protective glass or beauty disc reflector. When shooting with the ring light attached to your camera, remember to adjust all three of the bracket screws to help center the ring flash around your camera lens. By bringing it closer to your camera body, you can help avoid unwanted vignetting when using wider angle lenses. Turning on your modeling light while shooting may help you minimize possible red eye. Using a threaded screw adapter makes it easy to attach the bracket to a C-stand knuckle. We like that the R1200 easily fit in the AD1200 Pro rolling case. Even the bracket is collapsible. We are very impressed with the overall build quality and love the sizable four inch diameter of the inner circle, which accommodates most lenses. We found the beauty disc reflector to be extremely sturdy and the quality of light it creates highly desirable. Because the ring flash is lightweight, it's possible to be more spontaneous and handhold while shooting. Photographers looking to enhance details and soft shadows will love their new addition of this marvelous light. Thanks for watching, liking, and sharing this video. We can't wait to see what you create with Godox's newest ring flash, the R1200. Thank you, Aries. All right. We good to go on your end, Aries? Yes, sir. No, sir. Just want to make sure everybody can see my screen. You got me? Testing. You good?
Uh, is there any uh, common modifier string flash, older written flash, is 30 inch? Yep. Yep. I apologize, Aries. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, now, so, now I can hear you. Sorry, sorry I, um, I put myself on mute. Um, okay, perfect. I was like, I, I'm either going crazy or... <laughs> <laughs> so I see there's a question. Is there any coming modifiers for the ring flash? Uh, another brand has 30-inch and 59-inch softbox that you can mount to it. Uh, you can use it for a softbox or a ring. That way you get more usage. Great question. Aries, do you have any insight? Because you're the person I would turn to for a question. I, uh, I have no idea. I thought you, you would know. So that's why I put out the question to you. So uh, um, I, Sorry, I, I couldn't I, be I, help at the moment. Yeah. So I, I would not be surprised um, if uh, that Godox will continue. It, it, since they've rolled out this particular ring flash, I would not be surprised that they will create uh, additional modifiers uh, that are available for it uh, after they've done their initial launch. Uh, so I can't guarantee you that's going to happen. But I, I mean, would you feel, feel that that's fair, Aries? I mean, I would not be surprised that they come out with other things to support a product that, they, that they've introduced to the marketplace. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Any other questions real quick? Here's uh would love to see broader range of grades or for the heads as well as uh as the gels attached to the shape of the head. I think we have grades or three degrees, right? Yeah, they have they have three different grades that you can use. Uh, I think it's a 20, a 30, and a, a 40. I could be wrong on exactly which ones they are, but I believe that's what they uh the three different grids are. Uh but certainly. Uh, you know, uh, again, uh, if there's a need, a desire, uh, I'm sure that they will fill that in the, in the marketplace. Uh, you know, uh, when we think about what they've done with the magnetic attachments for the V1s and, and other lights like that, uh, I'd love to have just that kind of same, uh, uh, what would you say range mm -hmm. to the product line that they've come out with for the, for the R1200. Uh, that would be, uh, tremendous. And certainly with gels, there's, easy ways to be able to attach a gel or a sheet of sure. gel to something, whether you're clamping it or taping it or whatever you're doing, but having something that's more uh, yeah. modular and built in and uh, certainly makes it look uh, uh, a bit more professional mm -hmm. or sometimes easier uh, mm -hmm. to deal with if you were in a windy type situation or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So here Rob was hoping for a five degree sort of uh, grades. <laughs> if, uh, yeah, if they call me out, we will let you know. Yep. Well, you know what? I'm glad that you've got it out there into the world. Uh, and yeah. and uh, hopefully Godox marketing team will be able to see that and hear cool. that there's at least one person interested. Uh, if you uh, are also interested in five degree uh, grids, make sure that you like his comment uh, so that they can see that there's uh, there's a lot of people that are wanting to do that. That'll get, that'll get, get, get the attention. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that's, you know, that was more of a, of a studio type uh, exercise of, uh, of what you uh, might do. But what, do you, what about when you're in the real world? And uh, so we recently had a, uh, uh, a shoot that, uh, you know, you could call it quasi fashion. It really was for a, uh, a hair salon. Uh, and it was really a product line. A product line. It was really more about a product launch for a hair salon. Uh, so, in this case, you know, usually when you think about fashion, the clothing is more important than the model. Mm -hmm. The model is kind of secondary. They're just a, a form upon which the clothing is, is being held. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this particular case, both the clothing and the models were both kind of there as supporting elements mm -hmm. uh, to their overall narrative. But they were playing off of a theme, mm -hmm. uh, which was kind of this black and white type theme in the way that they were uh, doing things. And, uh, and so anyways, just to kind of give you an idea of what the run sheet looks like. Uh, I think we had 30 different shots uh, to accomplish. Uh, and we had it uh, basically between about 10 in the morning. And uh, we had to get done about, what would you say, about 5.30ish, something like that. Uh, so roughly 15 minutes is scheduled between each shoot. And if you've ever worked with a hair and makeup artist, uh, wonderful, talented people, like all artist types, uh, they're both perfectionists in their craft. Well, they probably had 30 hair and makeup artists and stylists working they were there. on all the, on the models. All, all the models all at the same time. time. Yep. Yeah. But, but they're, they want, they want things to be perfect. They see things just like we as photographers see things that are like, oh, this isn't right. This has to be fixed. Yeah. 
so the, the short of it is, is wound up with about a total of between three to five minutes of actual shooting time uh, with each particular model. And uh, we didn't even eat lunch that day. So the, the way that we got through it is, you know, uh, like many of you who work as some sort of a team, uh, my dad would leapfrog me and he would pre-light a scene for me uh, in, a, in a global type way uh, so that we could then walk in, get the model on set because you're having to do it without the model. You're just having to hear what the kind of look is that they're going for. And, uh, and then at that particular time, we could go into to be able to shoot him. So one of the things Aries was like, was like, can you show him what the scenes look like uh, before you... Uh, uh, without any light at all. And I go, that would be great, except for there's never really a situation where I don't already have my, uh, yeah. my, my uh, so you know, what it yeah. looks like me walking out the door. Yeah. So <laughs> anyways, here's a, here's a quick video that just uh, took my iPhone in the middle of the day, just to kind of give you an idea of just uh, the energy that was going on uh, in terms of, uh, of what it was like. <laughs> Oh my God. So hopefully that kind of gives you just, like I said, there's just, there's lots of moving parts that are happening. Uh, so how do we make this happen? We know we have very little time. We need ultimate flexibility. And so for that, we chose to use two different uh, approaches. Number one is uh, we use the, the beauty dish. In this particular case, we use the silver uh, beauty dish. It's also of course available in white. And uh, so uh, the, the woman that's behind uh, this particular brand uh, started off uh, shooting with her. And I did have one of my very first shots before we even uh, started to begin where I was just getting the light set up where I can prove to you without a shadow of the doubt that we were, <laughs> we were using the beauty dish ring flash and, uh, and kind of had it set up a little bit in kind of a loop lighting type style uh, above her. And then obviously had her stand up and uh, and start doing the actual shooting uh, with her. And so this was shot f 54 two fiftieth of a second, uh, one twenty five for my ISO. F four five. F four five. Thank you. I probably said that backwards. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dad. Uh, the next thing that we uh, wanted to be able to use because we knew we were going to have to do groups was uh, we said, well, we're going to need a large uh, modifier, and what better thing to be able to use uh, but a white umbrella. And so, of course, uh, there you have the big parabolic, and that's how it attaches on the parabolic. Uh, and, uh, and so from there, we were able to run into a variety of different scenes. So for this case, it was we had to climb out like a door, get on a little rooftop. There's this little area uh, right there with the stained glass. Uh, from memory, uh, we had a flash uh, like out on the other side in the interior space of those windows, uh, just so they didn't go completely dark. Right. Uh, and kind of flashing through there. And then we had the umbrella over on the, on the left-hand side, uh, lighting these three girls. And, uh, you know, of course the whole goal is yes, we want to have, uh, some shadows, but we don't want them to be, we're not looking for architectural statements in terms of what, uh, the shadows are doing. And so five, six, two fiftieth of a second ISO six flash that's going off in that area just to bring a, so that those, uh, opaque windows didn't go too dark. Right. Uh, so there's just a little bit of, of what I'd call almost like fake ambient light coming from there. We're not trying to overpower. We're not trying to blast light out of there. We just didn't want it to go dark uh, behind them. We wanted to keep it kind of light and even in terms of, of what's happening there. So two flashes, one inside and then one outside on the rooftop with us. For this next one, F4, 250th of a second, ISO 100, uh, use the uh, umbrella over here on the right-hand side and uh, just single umbrella, shooting it, quickly bringing them together. They were playing off of uh, some themes of some different plants. Part of the product line includes the Rose of Jericho, it includes aloe vera, it includes sunflowers. Uh, so they wanted those visual elements incorporated into uh, the photo and, uh, and using these particular uh, models. And some of the other looks that they had were uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know, uh, most of them were I don't want to say more neutral lighting, but uh, not as dramatic. And then they they had some that they wanted to specifically because it, it tied into the theme of that particular model, going to something a bit more dramatic. And so in this particular case, uh, we were using the uh, um, the uh, light outside. Uh, I believe this was uh, just the single head again uh, being used here, powering it up just a bit more. Overpowering the overpowering sun. Overpowering the sun just a bit more. 
Uh, you can see how the shadows are coming in uh, on the background of the of the the wall there from the the grates or whatever you want to call the architectural things on the side of the house uh, that are hitting on the back there. Uh, him with his swagger stick. This was the coolest guy in terms of like not only his hair but his beard. And he's an avid reader. He's like a complete book bookworm. Like if you actually talk to him, he's very soft spoken and quiet. Uh, but uh, he had kind of this uh, this cool look. He was in effect kind of their priest uh, type figure that they wanted to have uh, within the shoot. Uh, this is one I did get a base exposure. So there's a beautiful shot of the backside of my dad, and uh, we're outside. Uh, you know, this is uh, trying to get the house. Uh, we're starting to get together a, a group uh, for this. We went ahead and got uh, two lights uh, set up. They were double stacked. Uh, I'd say between 30 and 45 degrees set right next to each other just to try and create as large and directional light source as we could for a large group. And so for that, you're at F8, 250 the second, 125, uh, bringing everybody together for a shot. Uh, the dog, it's always about the dog, right? They want to add the dog at the last minute. You're going, uh, don't I have enough moving parts to work with beyond just a dog? <laughs> but let's make it happen. Uh, we then uh, did some other shots, which were much more in, uh, what would you call it, more of an editorial type style. Uh, it was easier whenever you're working with a single person and you have the ability to do a bit more contouring with your light, switch back to the beauty dish, uh, go into a bit more of the loop lighting in terms of that style. Shot on the left shows what she looks like without having the light added. On the right side shows once we added the light to the shot. Uh, next shot question, that we have uh, for you. Just for the, yep. Look, sorry, a question just for the yep. people who's um, our audience. Uh, what exactly is a loop lighting, if you can? Sure. So we want to just kind of walk through, kind of use my face here and kind of show them. If you do your hand from here in terms of it. But basically, if, if, if you had a 45 degree light that was here, where do you want to bring that light in order to create more loop? You put it pretty much a little bit more up here. Instead of the light being so far here, you're bringing it up. So it's more about the shadow that's happening under the nose. Shadow under the nose. Right. Which uh, yep. gets a, a defined chin and neckline. Yep. Uh -huh. Let me see if I can zoom in. I don't know if it's going to zoom in. Does this zoom in? Nope. Let's see if I can do it this way. Well, I'm trying. Nope. Maybe a little bit there, but you can see how strong that shadow is underneath her neck. So it's it's kind of ninety percent loop and a little bit of a Rembrandt because it's not directly uh, it's, it's, in the middle front. Yeah, it's not a butterfly type lighting, but you're creating just a stronger shadow underneath her neck and so forth, almost like her head is not supported as as it's there. So it creates just more of a little bit of a dramatic look. To the way that she's being presented. Her beautiful jawline. Yeah, that's, that was the whole key there is how do we make her jawline look as good as possible. Uh, for this next shot, uh, we're at F63, 250 the second, ISO 80. And uh, on the left is what the ambient exposure would look like. And on the right is kind of how the, uh, the final uh, shot came out. Uh, in this particular case, uh, I can't recall if this was an umbrella or if this was, was a beauty dish. I believe it was probably an umbrella because that's what we had. I think it was uh, this probably was an umbrella for, for what we had at that particular point. We were using outdoors. Um, and that becomes a thing. At like, that point, I stayed for that shoot. I wasn't leapfrogging. Yeah, exactly. Was this, was almost, this was almost at the very end. And, uh, you know, kind of one of the goals here was just to try and make sure that uh, didn't overpower things so far that we lost her hair inside of the darkness of the greens. Uh, that were that was there in terms of the trees, so trying to let in a little bit of ambient uh, to that particular shot. You know, there's kind of a role play gender reversal happening here. You know, uh, he's the one that has his head that's a little bit tilted. She's the one that's very straight on, very masculine in the way that she's being presented. Uh, and so that was kind of part of the theme that that they want us to play off of there. Uh, had to do another shot here. Uh, at the very end of uh, three of the stylists that worked for the salon. And uh, and so this was that base exposure there, F7-1, uh, a 30th of a second, uh, ISO 125. It's getting darker at this point. Uh, so trying to drag the shutter a bit, let in more ambient. And uh, so you wind up with a shot that looks something like this. Now, we didn't exclusively shoot with the R1200 during this, but this is also a lighting talk. So I feel like it's fair to be able to bring in 
some of the LED lighting that was used. And the reason that we didn't use a ring flash or a, um, uh, a flash of any kind was because we wanted even softer light because we were doing primarily interior type shots. That's correct. Now, if we had done this next shot that I'm going to show you with a flash, we could have had more detail even to the light bulbs that are being shown because we could have, uh, you know, overpowered the scene uh, to such a degree, but that wasn't the look they were wanting to go for. They wanted to go very soft, a lot of pastels or different colors and things like that. So that's what you see in this first particular shot. So literally, you know, there's a stairwell that's right there, right behind us. You're backed up as far as you can go. You can't get back any further with your tripod and yourself. Uh, you know, we've got the light coming through uh, a doorway that's just off to the left of the frame for a hallway door and uh, and bringing her in and, and being able to get a shot that looks something like this. F4, 125th of a second, ISO 640. Naturally, as we're getting into situations like this, our ISO is going up as our light is coming down that we're using to be able to do the shots. Uh, for this next one, different room, kind of going to more of a peachy pastels, uh, got that weird green color uh, combination. This is the natural colors within these particular rooms, the carpet that was in there. Uh, there was a painting that they had us replace the painting with uh, their branding, uh, but it's F4, a 400th of a second at uh, ISO 800. Now, why did I go to a 400th of a second? Well, this particular picture doesn't show it, but she was much more prone as a model to want to move. And so she is a, uh, a print model, which is a little bit different than what I'd call a runway model. Runway models definitely move because that's what they do. They walk a catwalk. Uh, but print models are very used to its shot, change position, change position. Uh, there's a, a thing that we call uh, slapping the tortilla, right? Their hands are constantly going like this. There's a picking cotton type thing that they do or pulling a thread type thing that they do with their hands just to kind of get their wrist bent and different movements. Uh, they knew, know how to do the step forward lunge type thing, you know, uh, to be able to make it look like they're flying through the air and that type of stuff. So uh, she was much more in that mode. And I quickly realized like, I've got to be able to raise my shutter speed <laughs> to be able to get something sharper for her, even though the one that they chose here uh, wound up being one that uh, uh, was fairly, uh, fairly flat. Another wanna, scene, go ahead. Quick question. Uh, look, uh, what lights and modifier did you use in previous shots? Do you want to share with us? Yeah, so on these particular ones, these were using the uh, the SL200s mm -hmm. for all of these uh, because we wanted to have that little bit more power and be able to use things like soft boxes and so forth uh, mm -hmm. to be able to soften uh, the particular lighting. The one I'm about to show you, and forgive me, Aries, but it's uh, it's the, uh, the light stick. Is that the uh, RC? Help me RC with 500. 500, RC 500, thank you. Uh, so we use the RC 500 in this particular shot. Uh, except we had, out the window. We except the 200. outside LED. the window. Yeah, when, when we had scouted the location with them, it was of course a, a beautifully bright lit day and with sunlight streaming through for this shot is what they imagined. And the reality of it was we had more of a kind of a gray overcast day. So we put the SL 200 outside kind of create that white light coming through the window without overpowering and then used an RC 500 to help light her face and then had, uh, at the, at the end of the night, we couldn't find one of them. That's true. One of them was horizontal under the sink. That's right. Put, producing a little glow light there. And at nighttime, all of a sudden it went into the that's, room. That's right. That's right. When we did our <laughs> idiot check and we went around looking everywhere, we were like, we're missing one of these. And then finally, because it had gotten dark outside, it was very obvious where we had left it underneath. <laughs> right, it was bright hours up, later. Hours later, but it runs. It runs. It did not die. Uh, so you know, it kind of gives you a sense of of kind of how you could mix those different LED lights uh, together. Uh, from here, we're uh, inside of interior space. Dad's booming a um, a two hundred uh, SL two hundred up over an old shower. Uh, to try and be able to get some light down uh, on her into this particular scene, not a large bathroom uh, to be able to shoot in. I'm standing just right outside the door, you know, kind of crouched down uh, to be able to get a shot uh, that looks something like this. Always fun to put models in like the least pretty places, right? <laughs> but that was kind of par that was part, part of it parcel. was rebirth from yes, rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all, that was kind of there. You know, taking what's old and making it new was all, all part of their, their theme and what they were trying to do. So that's what they're bringing these different elements. Uh, we have this gentleman here uh, where we had some, uh, some lights just off to his right, uh, also bouncing off the left. 
uh, to come in as some uh, uh, fill light that's going on there. And, uh, you know, again, tight space, probably using a 24 millimeter lens and, uh, and uh, F4 ISO 100 uh, at a hundredth of a second. When I showed you that video just a few minutes ago, uh, we were able to see kind of a little background of the setup of this particular scene. So the different things that was going on. Uh, this is what that shot ended up looking like. Here we can start raking some light across the background. Now, what do I mean about raking light? For example, you see that there's that light hitting the ground that's kind of coming in that triangular way to point towards her. Uh, that's an example of, of what I would mean. We used a strip box, uh, not only to produce a little bit of a separation light on the back of their bodies, but also to create kind of a visual um, uh, angle within the shot that created dimension and depth and also kind of pointed you right to the subjects. Off to the left is where we're using our uh, large softbox uh, to be able to, to kind of create uh, the, the main key light type look. And uh, so from there, we uh, so that's F4 uh, at 400th of a second, ISO 160. Uh, then we worked with this model here, Delaney. Uh, you'll see that she changes hairstyles very quickly here. This is her straight look uh, that she's doing. Uh, we're back in that peachy type area. We've got uh, a little bit of light coming and kissing off her shoulder and the back of her hair. Don't want to make it too strong or too dominant. Uh, because of the fact that she's a very skinny, uh, thin model, we can get away with broadside lighting her just a bit more. We wanted to make sure we had enough fall off on the light that the candle that was in her hand uh, was able to show very clearly. And so F4, 200th of a second, ISO 800. From there, you can see Delaney suddenly has curly hair. And, uh, and so here she is along with that other gentleman that we saw. And, and so this is again, just a simple in, indoors, uh, soft box over to that left hand side as our main light. And then we had put uh, two SL 200s outside uh, to create light kind of coming from the open doorways uh, or add additional light coming from those open doorways. So F8, 60th of a second, ISO 64. A lot of times when I'm shooting for something uh, that I know is going to be in print, you know, whenever possible, I try and shoot at whatever lowest ISO I can get away with. Um, ISO 64 happens just to be the native ISO. Do I stick to it? Uh, absolutely. No, absolutely not. Uh, and one of the things that you also find is when you go back and review uh, your images, you find that as you get more tired during the day, uh, you look back and you go, man, that was a pretty creative uh, combination that I had there. <laughs> like, how did I end up? And you're just flipping dials and getting your exposure dialed in and trying to maintain the connection uh, between you and the person that's in front of you. You know, the most important thing that I think you can do as a photographer when you have a model step in front of you is to stop and take the time and introduce yourself to them. Uh, shake their hand if, if it's possible. In COVID times, wave to them. Do something that gets them to betray their natural personality so you kind of know where they naturally go. And then that way you can tell uh, whether they're giving you everything that you may need or if you need it to be uh, less of what their uh, natural disposition in, is and for them to act more like an actor uh, in order to accomplish the client's goal, or if their natural personality is perfect for what they need and, and they're not giving you enough of it yet. So it's, a, it's an effective technique to stop, introduce yourself, make that connection with them, look them in the eyes, let them know that we're gonna get ready to get shooting, and then you're off to the races. Uh, yeah, sorry, just sorry, look at a quick question. So the previous image will have three lights, two correct. SL, hundred from outside the window and one SL 200 on the camera Inside. left yep. with softbox yep. directly like almost like I, 45 degrees towards the models, right? Yeah, from, from memory, he had actually put it in an umbrella at this point. This is an umbrella that is just out of the left frame there because this this is that room that you saw all that, um, uh, all the hairstylists were set up in. Okay, oh, okay. And when I did my spin through there, this is a little sliver that didn't have clutter. <laughs> Yeah, it is the Zen corner out of the chaos. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It is suddenly <laughs> like, hey guys, for the next five minutes, this space is ours. <laughs> so let's make it happen. Uh, so that's kind of how that that particular shot uh, came together. Uh, from there, we ran over to uh, a stairway, and uh, you know the stairs that we saw in the other picture going up just to our right, even though you can't see the the triangle that would be created from the the railing. Uh, this is the bench that's there. Uh, for this particular case, wanted to bring the lighting in a bit more dramatic. And so it's using a large octobox 
that was boomed in. Somebody's holding it over the staircases and I'm going lower, 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 because I'm looking for catch lights in those eyes uh, so that there's a little bit of life uh, coming into them. Uh, and so once you all of a sudden go, yep, that's it. You're trying to say to somebody, lock that into position. Of course, they're doing their best to counterbalance, but you, you still expect. It was handheld. Handheld, yeah, but you still expect wonders as the photographer. <laughs> right, so this is, is this one light, Tony? Uh, this was just one light. Yeah, oh, this was cool. This is really cool. Yep. But because it's a large octobox coming from above, you're getting spill I light. I, I think at the last second they added a uh, uh, stick. Uh, Where? LED stick. Where? Uh, at the top of the stairs. Maybe. To add a little, it was a little too much contrast. And I think somebody was holding it nice. And it was, uh, that could be true. I was looking yeah. through the lens. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I defer to you. I trust you. Audience love the images. Like here's a. Uh, Chevron saying that Ali saying that please show unboxing of this light also. <laughs> <laughs> so this is F4 one sixtieth of a second at ISO one sixty. Uh, from here uh, ran outside. Even in this exterior shot, it's a little bit under uh, an overhang, and so we went ahead and uh, brought in some. Uh, we I think we had two SL two hundreds that were being used just to try and light her evenly from head to toe. But you can tell we just want enough light hitting her face that it feels like it's uh, pretty light, a pretty quality of light. Uh, but we're not trying to produce strong shadows in this particular shot. Uh, you go from that to back to the priest theme, who, again, he was more masculine uh, in terms of what they were looking to do. Here's where they want to get into warm more drama, color warm color tones. Exactly. We went from our neutrals. Now we're going into our more of our, our warm yellows. And so you have something that looks like this. So F4. Uh, one one hundredth of a second ISO 320. And of course, you've got all sorts of things you're having to, to work through here. Um, number one, this uh, this mirror is reflecting back all that chaos that was happening in that room. So, you know, you have to drop down enough that you don't show all the clutter. Right. <laughs> that's that's the first and you know, most important thing is I can't show all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes. Uh, on top of that, uh, you know, there was a piano, there was a bar that was on wheels inside that room. We're trying to push them around, try and position lights in different places. Uh, we had the Octobox over to uh, their right hand side. On the left hand side, uh, we had a, uh, a light that had either a snoot or a grid on it, uh, just to create just a little bit of that light that's kissing off uh, the side of his forehead, uh, forehead uh, and uh, try and create just a sense of, uh, of a bit of separation. Interestingly enough, you know, you get into this idea of, okay, if you have your, your main light, where should your hair or separation light be placed? And if you uh, are here in the States and you are a PPA photographer, Professional Photographers of America, who is going through the uh, certified professional photographer uh, um, process, then they have a series of mandatory images that you've got to create. And one of those mandatory images is a portrait of someone where your uh, hair or separation light is on the same side as your main light. So if your main light's over here, your hair separation light has to be over here. Not in commercial. And I was sitting there trying to explain to my dad, you know, I was going through that process so I could uh, 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 experience it for myself, you know, make sure I understand of, of all that uh, people are being asked to to go through it. Uh, it was a wonderful experience for me to be able to go through. And uh, I'm trying to say to my dad, I've got to light it this way. And he goes, nobody lights it that way. And I go, well, for this exercise, it's got to be that way. Because but as a commercial can, photographer, how would you light it? Well, forget the kiss light that's on his forehead. Pretend like that was removed in post. Look at the separation light that's happening on his hair on the other side, which was important to get. Yeah. Yep. And that would have been in complete shadows had we not put the separation like that. That's exactly right. So a lot of times for uh, commercial photography, if you're for us, if your main light is on one side, your hair or separation light comes from the opposite as opposed okay. to coming from the same side. That's what I'm really trying to express to you. Which one is right? It's well, it comes down to your preference. I can tell you that visually speaking, the doing an opposite a lot of times creates a better look to I th me. I think every scene is so different. I think if you understand lighting, it'll be different almost every time. Sure. Yeah. But you do I'm default. Just, My default is yeah. opposite. I'm just trying yeah. to work this out in my head because uh, lots of time in the movie we see um, it's almost right. like split. It's like face light on this way, hair light on the other way. We, our eyes, it's so naturally 
That's correct. Saying, correct. You know, this is conventional way of uh, doing yeah. lights. So I was wondering, process-wise, why do you light the face on this way, hair on this way? Which means you probably need third lights as a fill light. So you know, how does it work? How does it work? Sure. Well, you absolutely could use uh, a third light as a fill light, bounce a light, or yeah, or good. kick a light okay. inside of there. For this particular theme, this one was supposed to be darker, moodier, uh, more directional lighting. You can see the shadows uh, that are underneath them are, are darker uh, than perhaps, like I'll skip ahead to this one. This one has a much yep. different feel in terms of it. Those shadows are much softer, more, you can see the light that's coming through the room. So you're trying to match your lighting to the theme based off of, if I was to jump back here for you for one second, uh, here's what you're constantly referring to. You're referring to something that looks like this, right? And they're saying to you, okay, uh, here's here's look one or look two. Here are the props, Rose of Jericho. It's against the blue wall. You know, uh, what we're basically, uh, we've sat down with them, we've looked at their mood and inspiration boards to be able to say, like I knew and you knew with the priest theme, it was supposed to be dark and masculine and warm. Those were the keys. And then for other things, it was light and feminine or neutral, you know, so you're trying to match your lighting style to specifically whatever your client's uh, briefs directions are. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so, yep. So from there, our, uh, our next shot then was going back to this particular uh, uh, mix. We're back on the stairs again. You know, we repurposed these stairs. We did a shot a moment ago, which was, uh, this particular one and the stairs are a bit more secondary uh, and much more in the distance. Uh, now we've got to come up with a different shot in the same space. And so for this particular shot, now we're at five, six, two minutes a second, ISO 800. It's later in the day. Uh, need a little bit of light that's coming uh, through those uh, leaded glass windows uh, and be able to light the scene. The light's coming from the left-hand side from over here. Uh, I feel like you put a light up on top I of the did. stairs uh, to come back and, and hit them from behind. I did. In particular, this was a wet look. So they really wanted the hair to look very slick. And, uh, you know, forgive me, I'm going to see how this, it loves to go to the right. So I'm going to see what I can do here as I try and zoom it. But hopefully you can kind of see here, there's a little bit of glisten to their hair. Can you see that coming through on your end, Aries, at all? Yep. Yep. Uh, so the whole point here is we needed to show wet. It was a wet look. Uh, and if I was to jump back to their outdoor scene, which I think was this one, uh, this was a different type look. Uh, well, we can't see it very well. So but th was th th this was a gelled type look uh, that they had gone for uh, in terms of their hair. So all these sorts of different things that you kind of have to, you, you put together and figure out how do you make it work and you work quickly and you do it as a team. I think that's the goal. Yeah. So does that help kind of explain some things? Does to me. Yeah. What more questions can we help answer for your audience? Oh, so far we are good. I think um, um, if there's no further, I haven't seen any question. Guys, uh, we will just stay on here for another two minutes in case you guys have any any, any other questions. And uh, yeah, that was fantastic. I, I quite enjoyed, to be honest, I quite enjoyed the sh um, everything of it. And uh, obviously um, everybody loves the, the LED talk especially when you show the behind the scene, like you create such beautiful scenes out of all, all those chaos. And it's amazing how SL200, we can achieve so much with LED yeah. lights in terms of my photography now. LED, yeah. that's my favorite. Yeah. Um, but again, the ring flash came in so, the beauty dish type thing came in so handy for a shot like yeah. this. The beauty dish came in so handy uh, for a shot like this uh, to be able to work quickly and, and efficiently. And then, you know, all of a sudden you need to switch to something else. You're doing a larger group. I think anytime you kind of get beyond uh, two or more, then that's when I'd want to go to the, the larger light source in terms of doing it. In this particular case, you'll notice every single shot is basically uh, straight on and not a lot of dramatic posing. The, the most dramatic posing that you really have is, you know, this girl has a little bit of kick to her hips and a little bend to her elbow. 
uh, the guy on the front porch. Yeah, the, front the guy on the front porch had a little bit. You know, here, uh, masculine posing was okay to them. Uh, they wanted to project that feeling from this particular girl, so they wanted her arms crossed. But otherwise, it's just a very straight type thing. And so a lot of what I'd call your portrait conventions uh, of what you need to do, other than like we told the guy to go ahead and bend his knee since he was supposed to play the more feminine role. Like that was just a simple way to just kind of soften him a little bit so it didn't compete too hard. Uh, yeah. in, a, in a similar way, when we shot this guy uh, at the very end, uh, you'll notice uh, his feet are the ones that are pigeon-toed, right? Typically, a man is never pigeon-toed. Uh, but if she's supposed to be the one that's very straight on, uh, if she went pigeon-toed, she'd look more feminine. And so, you know, the question was they wanted to figure out how to – they liked him there, but they wanted to figure out how they could make him even just a little bit more subtly feminine. And so I just said, well, the first step would be start with his feet. And so let's let's bring those in and make those a little bit more pigeon-toed. Yeah. Uh, the reason I uh, I appreciate you guys using um, SL two hundred is because number one, audience seems to love them so much, and number two, that all all of a sudden that reminds me that uh, if you know, in case in the future, if they want to do some promo video, the um, LED light will comes handy, right? Because you you yeah. can. You can shoot photos and it, and and uh, sort of videos exactly at the same time. This is exactly fantastic. Right. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly right. Our studio is pretty much set up with SL two hundreds now because they they do such a wonderful job for when we're doing interior studio stuff. Yep, yep. Especially well, considering we, like with um with real or TikTok, they are so popular nowadays. It's, even you are doing photography, even like me as myself as a photographer, I always put some 15 seconds of behind behind the scene with sure. you know L, it's the LED lights. This is like a heaven, you were saying. But if you get into a situation like this shot, you're not yeah. gonna pull that off with an LED light, uh -huh. right? That's where yeah. all of a sudden you go, I've got to have more power. Gotta I've got to sun, I've got to yeah. I've got to do something to create a bit more drama, you know, within the exactly. within it was probably one o'clock in the afternoon. It, <laughs> yeah. it was, it was. And, you know, well, there were fire engines going by down the street and just kind of all kinds of stuff. And like I said, it's always that thing where they go, can we add the dog? And you go, sure. <laughs> so, well, there's no silver bullets again, right? It's just um, what's the right tools for you, really, um, whatever makes it work. It, well, um, What's the right tool for you? And do you know how to use the tools you have? And once you get exactly. to a point where you realize that there's a tool that you don't have that would solve a particular problem, because that's what tools do. They solve a particular problem. Uh, then that's when it informs you to be able to say, ah, oh, now I know exactly why I need to have this particular light. Yeah. Uh, you know, and all things being equal, that R1200, just the softness of the of that light that comes off of it, just mm -hmm. in a generalized basis, is is so much more desirable to me because I still get the feeling of a beauty dish, mm -hmm. but it's a softer quality of a beauty dish, uh, you know, when it's used compared to using the standard head and then just putting it in a beauty dish. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, thank you very much guys for your time. And uh, I think this is great. And uh, I'll chat, catch up with you guys um, after new year. And for now, everybody, see you guys. I'll see you guys until next week. Thank Bye. you.